Hey everyone, it's Rob Stanley with Feedback Wiz and Ecom Wiz podcast. I'm here today with Steve Simonson from CEO from Simon Global. And uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, basically sourcing from China and also from Vietnam and what is going on basically with the current tariffs going on and uh, some hits, hints and tips and things. Steve actually just got back from uh, doing kind of a big tour over in China and Vietnam. So Steve, thanks for being on the video podcast and the podcast itself. I appreciate it. Yeah, certainly my pleasure. Uh, I love talking about sourcing and uh, I love helping entrepreneurs. So these are two of my favorite things. That's awesome. Well, I've actually, I, I've, I've known Steve, I probably say only about six or eight months now, but uh, absolutely had an instant connection with him. Uh, he's just full of knowledge. We both come from pretty old school e-commerce days. Uh, so I've been just waiting to get them on on our uh, podcast here. So, so let's kick it off, Steve. Uh, let Let's start with some maybe. Uh, let's talk about anybody who's selling the ecom. Let's say they're just getting going. At what point when they start selling online or selling on Amazon or wherever they're selling, should they look at actually physically going overseas to where they're manufacturing items? Uh, let's kind of go into that a little bit. On you know, because I, when I got started. I never thought about really going over there first thing uh, until I kind of built the business up. So do you, you know, maybe agree with that or what kind of points do you have on that? Well, I've, I've definitely seen it both ways. Um, I myself, uh, you know, I probably started buying in around 2001 from China and I didn't go until around 2002 and, and I actually started taking people in 2003 and beyond. And, and it, that was fine for us as far as a, as a pattern. But I'll, I'll tell you, it, it really accelerated my understanding of the, the supply chain in China and the production process in a way that, you know, if I had done it earlier, I wouldn't have regretted it. And so I have seen people who are just starting out who they don't quite have it all figured out where they make the investment and they, they get over to China and talk to their factories or go to trade shows or what have you. And I think it's really just a question of resources. If you have that resource, I think you can actually accelerate your understanding in time if you go, but it's certainly not necessary. And I actually have a good friend of mine. Uh, he probably for four or five years was importing thirty to forty million dollars a year from China, and he didn't go for the first you know four or five years. So it, it can be done any number of ways. That's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I would say maybe a rule of thumb, depending on your business, maybe maybe wait one year just to kind of get your business established, understand a little bit. Obviously, if within that first year you're doing a ton of business, you might want to accelerate that. But for, let's say, the average online seller, maybe uh, wait that first year, uh, get your business established, uh, kind of find out as much as you can, and then head over to you know, either China or wherever you're sourcing from. So that's great. That's great information, actually. And so let's talk about, actually, Steve just got back from this trip. So let, let's dive into this trip that you just did, Steve, because there's a ton going on around this trip regarding uh, tariffs and factories, and you went to Vietnam. Maybe start us off with uh, what, first of all, there was a little bit of a joke to get you to finally go on this trip, if I'm not mistaken. Why don't you talk a little about that and how you ended up going on this trip? <laughs> um, well, there's, you know, some of the, the realities of uh, my time is very, very difficult. And so, um, you know, it's often whichever base of constituents that I have is pushing me the hardest or, or screaming the loudest. And so, uh, Oksana Brookie and Melissa Simonson pushed me into kind of doing some more China stuff. And uh, so I, I've set up a trip for October. But Vietnam was really, it's a good example for people out there because we started buying in a more serious way. Um, and I, I count serious way and, you know, buying millions a year from Vietnam a couple, two, three years ago. And my team has been there many, many times. But I, this is the first time I ever went. And I went as a matter of urgency because – it, the, all of the tariff uh, saber rattling and all the, the trade war talk, it just, it, I wanted to f have feet on the street, as I like to call it, and really understand, you know, a little bit more about the, the opportunities there, the challenges there in Vietnam, and there's both uh, challenges and opportunities. And I just want to see firsthand some of the, the factory bases, what are the good industries that they're prepared for. And, and again, just kind of understand, for me now, that's how I learn. I have to be on the street. I have to understand and I have to meet people and then I will be able to put the puzzle together. 
Yeah, no, that's a good point. And before we dive, because um, we're going to dive deeper into your trip on some of the things you did find and maybe some things that can help people. But let's back up just a smidge and talk a little bit about, okay, if, if you're an online seller, you're going to start seeing, uh, let's say, different trade shows going on either in Hong Kong or in uh, mainland China. Um, I'm sure you've experienced them. I've been to quite a few of them. Let's talk a little bit about maybe some pros and cons of going to some of those trips. Uh, for instance, let's talk about Hong Kong. There's the uh, Global Sources is a big one there. Um, you know, what kind of benefits or what do you see from going to a show like that for a seller at Global Sources in Hong Kong? Yeah, so Global Sources and among many other trade shows in Hong Kong, often strategically located around uh, Canton Fair time frame. So Canton Fair is a big fair in China. And then wisely, the guys in Hong Kong are like, well, let's bolt on before, during, middle, after, whatever. Um, and so there's electronic shows, there's gift shows, there's, you know, home shows, uh, and obviously global sources as well. And so, you know, all of those shows, they could be in the Hong Kong Convention Center or at the airport by Hong Kong. But I, to me, it gives you a big opportunity to see a lot of different suppliers, a lot of different paths to developing your supply chain that you may not see. Like, I, I know... And more than half, I would estimate, do, that participate in a Hong Kong show may not participate in Canton for one reason or another. They Maybe they feel it's their target market that they're reaching better in Hong Kong. or I'm not sure the exact rationale, but many times they're not in both places. So you really can see a unique um, potential offering and a unique uh, set of products from, from going to the Hong Kong shows. I love Hong Kong. Hong Kong's a beautiful town, easy to get around. And uh, it's certainly well worth the stop in if you happen to be in the neighborhood. Yeah, and let's, uh, just so people are listening, let's talk a little bit about logistics to get to Hong Kong. Uh, I mean, with Hong Kong, you only need a standard American passport, no special, you know, visa, basically. Uh, tons of flights go out of, uh, especially the West Coast, if anybody's on the West Coast, or you come usually through the West Coast, right to Hong Kong. Uh, so you don't usually have a layover. I mean, some will, but uh, many don't. So there, there is a lot of benefits and there's usually, I've noticed at least on the electronic side, there's usually two shows going on. There's one at the airport and then one at the convention center. So it gives you, I would say that's a really good sort of first step for somebody who uh, has been running an online business for let's say a year, kind of wants to go over and kind of understand a little better, maybe if you even look for new products or resources. Uh, and you're right, Hong Kong's amazing. I, that's absolutely one of my favorite places to visit also. Uh, so there's some, I mean, some amazing places to eat there and there's amazing, uh, people. It really, it is, is a very great experience and you're right there. I, I've also seen where, uh, we actually saw a lot of, uh, people from uh, Taiwan selling at global sources compared to Canton. So now anybody who's listening to us, you'll want to probably Google Canton fair and Google global sources or any of the shows in Hong Kong, just so you get a good understanding because I want to dive in with Steve about Canton Fair. I've been to Canton Fair for many, many years. Just to give everybody a little, let's give them a little, if they're in their car listening to us, a little understanding of just how big Canton Fair is. Let's imagine a giant football stadium and let's take that football stadium and let's make it three stories worth of floors. Then let's take that and put three of those all next to each other and that would be Canton Fair, which each of the floors having different items on it or zoned to different. So if you're looking for specific items, that's not to include the fact that each week is different phases of this, meaning there's different products one week, they all leave, or at least probably 99% of them leave. And the next week, a bunch of different vendors come in there. So depending on what you're looking for, you can actually pick specific times. And what Steve was talking about is when you go to Canton Fair, usually in that weekend in between the phases is when Global Sources or some of the other shows are going to Hong Kong. So we jump on a train, go down to Hong Kong, go to that show and come back for the next phase. So Steve, what things have you seen or, or what's your feel on Canton Fair as far as, I mean, people are going to be overwhelmed when they first get there, obviously. I was, and, and it takes a, a, quite a bit to adjust. So what kind of tips maybe you could give uh, for people going to, probably not just Canton Fair, but you know, just going to a trade show in general? Yeah, well, the first thing, uh, these, be prepared to be overwhelmed. I think you know, the, the acknowledgement that this is um, just a, a sensory experience that you probably have never seen before. It is massive in scale and scope and variety and so forth. 
So I think that's important. The Canton Fair specifically, people should really know if their industry is represented in that particular phase. As you pointed out wisely, Rob, that it's broken into phase one, phase two, phase three. Well, if you're into automotive parts and you go to the wrong phase, you're not going to see anything uh, that's related to your industry. So knowing what vertical that you happen to trade in or that you're interested in uh, and then which phase that happens to align with will help you make sure that you're there at the right time. Phase two and phase three are typically the, the most friendly for, for consumer commodities that, that most Amazon sellers or e-commerce guys trade in. Um, but the other thing I always recommend is I use Evernote like a maniac when I'm there. Um, I also make sure that I have data so that when I'm over there I can, I can stay connected. It doesn't matter whether it's Hong Kong or uh, China. I want to make sure that I can stay connected. Uh, there's different ways of doing that, but fundamentally, I want my Evernote to always be up to date. And I'll literally take the picture of the booth. I'll often take a selfie with the, the sales rep of me just to make them have a warm, fuzzy later. They love that, by the way. Yep. Um, I will take pictures of the cards. I'll take pictures of the samples. I'll write in pricing notes, discussion notes, because I'll tell you, at, even at the end of a day or even by lunch, you won't even remember what happened uh, you know, on your first visit by a booth. And so having almost a um, you know, photographic uh, reminder of your day will actually help way, you know, bring your memory back. And so uh, Evernote, I love that uh, process and I love that tool because you can do video notes, you can do audio notes, photo notes, you can do anything you want into an Evernote. And then, of course, at some point it's going to cloud sync and, and your data is safe. So, I highly recommend going with a plan, but being prepared to discover as well, because both sides can serve you well. Yeah, and I'm gonna add a little bit to that from things I learned from going there too. Uh, a, bring an extra suitcase, because you're gonna be bringing a lot of catalogs back. So make sure you either have room in your suitcase or you have uh, brought an extra one with you to bring back. Uh, B, bring a backpack to put all the catalogs you're gonna get in. Uh, so you're not having to hold them by hand. Even though they give you the bag, I found the backpack's a little better. Make sure you have water with you. That's one thing I've learned too. And then actually, one thing that we found, and I don't know uh, if you know this, Steve, they have free Wi-Fi there, but we found actually there's so many people hitting the Wi-Fi there. If you're trying to look something up, uh, we usually carried around an iPad with us to try to look things up or kind of keep things and also had a CRM software with us. But um, we actually carried a Wi-Fi hotspot and a 4G Wi-Fi hotspot that only the three of us were connected to, kind of gave us our own internet basically, and we were able to look stuff on it uh, like immediately. So that actually was one tip that I'll uh, give that was worked out great. The other thing is make sure that you're there first thing in the morning. Uh, first thing in the morning is the best time because as you get a little further into the morning, it gets a lot crowded, a lot more crowded and harder to get in. Um, and Steve's right, you're gonna end up with a lot of pictures, a lot of notes, uh, we used to take catalogs, put pricing right on the front or fold the page of the item we were interested in, uh, put their booth number on the front so we could go back the next day. So this is definitely not a one day thing is what Steve and I are saying. You're going to need, for us, and we had it kind of down pat, it was a minimum three days. I would say for the first timer, probably give yourself about four days. Also, try not to hit the tail end of whatever phase it is because a lot of the booths start closing on the last day, even though they're not supposed to. So. There's some great, great tips there. I, heck, we could almost do a whole podcast just on uh, Canton Fair because there's just so much involved around it. But uh, so let's talk about a little more. Uh, it, oh, uh, the other thing you should do is if you know vendors you're working with are going to be there, set up times to go meet with them at their booth. They'll be happy to do that. And I'm sure you've seen that, Steve. And the thing we found, though, is if people are interested, let's say, in going to their factories afterwards, um, it's not that you can't, most will at least have a salesperson, but a lot of times, I, don't, I won't, don't wanna say they're necessarily shut down, but they're in less phase because everybody's kinda of out of that office at Canton. Have you seen that same experience? Yeah, for sure, you know, just preceding the fair or just after, especially if they have a big um, operation or enterprise, you know, the bosses and the, the main people are all kind of on the road. And so, you know, often maybe you can go see the factory and somebody can uh, carry you around, but you're not getting the best experience. And then often again, whatever experience you do get, you'll be lumped in with, you know, other people who are trying the same thing. It doesn't mean it's not worthwhile, but you should just expect that if you, you know, put a week between yourself and a, an affair like that to go visit a factory, you're going to get a lot more star treatment. You'll be 
you know, it'll be boss to, to boss and, and there'll be a lot more lunches and dinners and so forth. Um, but it, it really, you know, your time is valuable. I definitely agree that if you're, if you have suppliers, then you should, by all means, you should meet with them at the Canton Fair. Often they'll try to, you know, have you out for drinks or something. And, and any of that relationship building, I think, is, is a wise investment as long as there's real hope of doing some business. I don't waste time if there's no hope just to be polite. It's like, hey, I'm, I'm busy. We got a lot of things going. And w if we don't have a lot of time, we'll ask them to come to our hotel as well um, and, and just kind of fit stuff in where we need to. Yeah, as you're, as you're going around to the booths, uh, odds are, depending on what you're selling, you're going to find multiple vendors selling probably the same item or factories selling the same item. Uh, cut your losses if you're not getting the information you want or the pricing you want and move on to the next one. Uh, because that was one thing. I mean, we had this one item. I think we went to seven different booths before we finally found one that it was the right price. And let me tell you, seven booths sounds real easy, but not when you're sitting there for 10, 15 minutes per booth trying to figure it out. The guy's making phone calls and trying to, you know, get you the pricing. So that's a, that's a great tip. The other tip I want to give, and this is kind of an expensive tip, but if for a first timer, have you stayed at the Westin, Steve, that's connected to the Canton Fair? <laughs> I have, but I'm too poor to stay there on a regular basis. Oh yeah, my God. I agree with you. And that's why I'm, I'm going to make a point though, but having that semi-private entrance from the West End, maybe for the first time, if you can afford it, and we're talking, I think it's close to $600 a night as we speak during the Canton Fair to stay there. Um, if it's your first time and you can afford it, I would recommend it because it does give you an entrance where you don't have to go through the main entrance. It's kind of crowded to get in. And it, it does give you a little extra benefit of, of getting in and out of there a bit quicker. So maybe uh, if you can afford it and, and you, and you uh, are going over there for the first time, it's definitely worth looking at. Now, let's go into factories. Let's, so let's, we've done the Canton Fair. Maybe we've been down to Hong Kong for a week uh, and we want to go visit our factories. Maybe let's step people through what some of the steps to do that, right? Like, First of all, you're probably going to get on a train in Hong Kong to go to wherever city you're going to go to, most likely. Um, so kind of step us through what you do uh, at that point. Like, how do you arrange it and get going? Yeah, so uh, it, China's a very large country. So really understand the geography ahead of time is, is essential. So in the, in the southern part, uh, the Dongguan region, which is, includes Guangzhou, that's where the Canton Fair is, and Shenzhen, and kind of all parts in between, there, there's all of that is train accessible, no problems, uh, good stuff, and and arranging it with the, the the rail, you know, out of Hong Kong or out of one of those cities is is no problem, fairly easy to do, and relatively inexpensive. Um, for me, we will try to line those things up ahead of time. And by the way, for those areas that are not close enough, for example, you can take a train from Guangzhou to Iwu, but that's like six hours. There's no way I'm taking a six-hour train. And that, by the way, that's a fast train. Yeah. Uh, so we will fly up to the middle or up to the north when necessary. And we use the trains for anything less than four hours, basically. Uh, because once you start thinking about checking in at the airport and going through security and all that, you know, the net effect of a you know, four-hour train ride is the same as a two-hour plane flight, at least. Um, so we will set those appointments up ahead of time. We, if we don't know what we're there to ask, like if you're a newbie and you've never been to a factory, just go to learn and understand every single machine, every single process. If you don't know what it does, ask and have them demonstrate it to you to the greatest extent possible. Your understanding of the supply chain and the production process will be extraordinarily advanced if you kind of embrace it as a learning opportunity. You know, I remember Sesame Street used to take you through the, the candy factory, right? And they're like, hey, how do you make this? And, and I, I don't know, I was fascinated by that stuff. You should go in with that fascination and go, what does that do? Why is it there? What's that bucket of stuff you keep pouring on that? And really be inquisitive and have a passionate curiosity because without it, you're going to get a surprise. And I do not like unexpected surprises out of China. Yeah, that, that's a great point. The, um, the other thing I suggest is uh, if you are using the hotspot, like we said, uh, you're going to probably end up using WeChat to communicate with uh, the salesperson. And the reason you want to do that is when the train gets to wherever it is, a lot of times they'll have a car there to pick you up with a person, a salesperson or somebody from the factory will pick you up uh, with the car. I mean, I've never been charged for a car. They've always kind of been a courtesy uh, to pick you up in a car. So remember that. 
And then, you know, just show courtesy back and go learn. I mean, each factory, whether you're going to buy from them or not, is a chance to learn, whether it's learn what not to look for or learn what you should be looking for, because you're going to see a wide variety. So, Steve, let's talk a little bit. <laughs> I could probably talk about it myself, but why don't you tell us about just how wide the spectrum of factories are and what they look like and then what other ones look like, like up the chain. So oh, they can yeah. kind of understand what to expect on something like this. Yes. So I've been going to China many, many years. As I said, uh, you know, 18 ish years. Um, and, and over that time I've seen things that would, uh, would, uh, <laughs> surprise anyone from anywhere, but you know, just on, like I've been into places that are, they seem like a junkyard almost, right? There are maybe, um, upholstery or, or accessories types of manufacturing. There's scraps are everywhere, and there's literally piles, you know, higher than this, the height of men of just waste and, you know, overruns or excess or whatever it is. And, you know, and that's, to be honest, that wasn't a terrible factory. It was just disorganized, in my opinion, and not super clean. Um, whereas I've been in other factories that are like the ultimate clean rooms. You know, we had to get sprayed down, we had to put on special uniforms you know, just to get into the production environment because they were the absolute tip top of clean room quality. So that, that spectrum from, you know, literally you feel like you're walking through a junkyard all the way through to better than any hospital you've ever been into. It really is that full spectrum in my opinion. Yeah. So don't be thrown off because I, I've seen the same thing. Like when I, I mean, I, I made it very clear to everybody I used to do iPhone parts, right? Before I sold my business. So I was in probably somewhere near 20 different screen protector companies. And I saw everything from a dirt floor to I had to put on a clean room bunny suit to go in. Now, it didn't necessarily mean that the ones that had dirt floors were better or worse. It just meant that they had different qualities. And you really had to look at what meets your needs and what were you looking for. Because then I've been to another factory that it was nothing but dirt, but we were doing metal, sheet metal. Well, I don't need it to be a clean room when I'm doing sheet metal because the purpose of it was a metal box. I won't go into detail, but there was no need for a clean room. So you're absolutely right. You're going to see an uh, entire like variety of different uh, things uh, as far as uh, factories are concerned. So, so maybe uh, uh, let's talk about when you go into that factory, let's maybe step people through some of what will happen in general, right? Like uh, I'll start you off. Let's, most of the time you get to the factory, you're going to meet the people uh, sometimes there'll be a presentation line. We can talk a little bit about that. And then they usually kind of put you into like uh, what I always call the showroom, right? So maybe step a little bit through that and maybe what uh, you do from there and how you handle things from the times you've been there. Yeah, so it's, it is, um, you know, I, I never go in with judgment about a factory, right? I'm, I always like, I don't know nothing about nothing. And so any of the environmental or location or any of that stuff, I just let it kind of flow over me and then I, uh, form an opinion later. Um, so when, when I arrive, uh, often they'll, if they have, you know, little signs, they'll, they'll make banners, they've had signs with our name, sometimes our pictures, you know, welcome, they want to make it into a big deal. Uh, often the boss is there, they'll come down, shake your hand. They'll usually uh, either take us to the showroom or to the conference room. Um, and, and then we'll step through any of the products that we're interested in or things that they're trying to push towards us. If we're already buying things, you know, you'll see the things that we already make there and then other things we may be interested in. Maybe we haven't even thought about, but they'll introduce these ideas to us, which I think is a, a big, important deal. And, and I will just say this from a, an advanced level, part of their objective is they want to monopolize as much time as they can for you. <laughs> and so believe me, if you show up in the morning, they're planning on, you know, putting you to bed at night uh, because they, they figure as long as you're there with them, you're no, with nobody else. Uh, my schedule doesn't allow for that. So often we're hitting, you know, two, three, four, five factories in a day in the same region. So we will often then push and say, well, hey, listen, we need to get out on the factory floor. And then we'll push for that. And we'll go out and we'll look again at every single machine, every pr preparation area, like where are they storing uh, the materials? Where are they storing any chemicals they may use? Where are they disposing any of that stuff? Because we want to check for some of the things that tell us if they're using the right products or the right additives or, or uh, you know, raw materials, et cetera. And, and we want to, we, we trust, but we verify, right? Because that's what a, a buyer is supposed to do. So we'll walk through every part of that and then we'll end up back in the conference room 
uh, and and then we will talk about business. You know, they'll say how many more containers. You know, will you take? <laughs> and then we'll uh, negotiate about price or items or quality or whatever the topic of the day is. But it's it's a very full uh, agenda. And then if we can, we'll have a meal with who, whomever we're with. But if we can't, then we move on to the next one. And inevitably, we get roped into two extravagant meals uh, every day with uh, suppliers. But it's, I think it's a great experience. I've enjoyed it every time I've gone. Even when I'm out in an oppressive hot factory, I still think about how lucky I am. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's a perfect sort of uh, guide to uh, your uh, basic factory right there for sure. Yeah, we did we did the same thing. We'd usually go to four to five factories. We may we usually skip the meals because uh, we just had we wanted to get everything in right. I, I looked at it this way: time is money, and I'm spending a lot of money to get over there. I want to get to each one I can. It's not that you don't need to eat; you need to stop and eat, obviously. But uh, we tried to minimize as much as possible and maximize the amount of factories we'd hit. Uh, so that, that's some uh, great information. And yeah, uh, be ready because uh, some of the best products I've ever found were actually in the showroom that we didn't even know they made. And so actually think of that showroom almost like going to a trade show, like a mini trade show. Uh, it, especially if it's a factory that you know the quality is good from, you're already buying from, you're just piggybacking another product they already make. So we've actually done that where we started with a factory buying like one item and I think we eventually were buying seven different items from them after we went to that showroom and uh, looked at all the different products and got pricing. So that is a great, great tip right there to basically uh, look at a way to increase your products that you sell. So Yeah, Rob, I think that's really well said and, and something that we did on a regular basis. One of the other things you will see inevitably is cartons and products of other people, competitors. And I, I'm always very open. I'm like, who else do you supply? Who is your biggest customer? What about Europe? What about America? What about, you know, wherever? And, uh, and in many cases, like there are some products that we had um, we did some cell phone accessories for a company I had a, a few years ago and Griffin was one of the big um, brands in that category and we saw that they were making the styluses for Griffin there. They had a little laser pointer stylus there and we saw them coming down the line and we're like, hey, uh, you know, how much is it to get one of those? And they're like, well, you know, the MOQs, you know, 28,000 pieces or 38,000, some crazy number. Yeah. And we're like, forget MOQ, we'll just, every time they order, we'll, we'll add on 5,000 to the Pretty end back. of the run. Yep. And uh, they're like, oh, okay, fine. And, you know, as those, you know, production would happen, they would come down on their side and get their imprint and, you know, laser etching and come down on our side, got our own brand laser etching. But capping on to somebody else's run is another thing you, you generally won't understand how to do until you go to the factory and see what else they're making. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you're giving away our age talking about styluses and tylu people probably don't even know what a stylus is nowadays. And Griffin, I remember them. I mean, I, I go way back too. So, yeah. So, so let's. Uh, so, I mean, there used to be there used to be uh, traditions when you went into factories, uh, as far as like you would start with the highest, uh, the person that's the most senior, hand them your business card. You use two hands and hand it to them, just so people know. If you go and read online and find old information, a lot of that has pretty much gone out the door. They understand uh, that you know they're dealing with uh, what they call the West, right? They're dealing with the West. And they understand that we pretty much just hand cards out like regular and we just hand them to whoever's in front of us. So you don't necessarily have to follow the traditions as much. Um, you know, I just, I always found just being, you know, very kind to them and very nice and just ask questions. They're, they're happy. Like Steve was just saying, ask about, can I piggyback onto this? Ask about, you know, uh, oh, great scenario. We, uh, we were getting this product and it had two batteries in it and we were like, well, does it work with one battery? And they're like, yeah, because it was two, uh, 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 what do you call them, uh, coin-shaped batteries stacked on top of each other. And we saw that the, the spring in it was really long and they're like, yeah, it works with one, but you only get four hours instead of uh, six. And I'm like, I don't think people really need to use this more than four hours. So how much without that extra battery? I mean, there's just little things like that. If we didn't know and ordered 10,000 of them and they came in and we had to pay for that extra battery, that really people probably didn't need anyways. I mean, those are just things that being at that factory physically hands-on. Uh, the other thing is ask about the materials they're using. Are they using recycled aluminum? Are they using real aluminum? What grade of steel are they using? 
Are, is the plastic pellets they're using recycled plastic or brand new plastic? So understanding the industry or the products you're selling will help and make sure you ask those questions when you get over there. So that's a great uh, bit of information that you give, Steve. Uh, what about, so let's talk a little bit about how do I get from the next, from one factory to the next? Because uh, there, there is a little bit to that or people might be going, well, okay, I got to the first factory. What do I do now? How do I get to the second one? I'm not, I don't have a car. Maybe talk a little about uh, how you get around once you're there. Well, again, it, there's lots of ways to do it. Um, so uh, most of the time, my team, I have a full-time team there. So they'll, if we don't want to tell the factory where we're going, we just order a DD, which is similar to an Uber, and, and we'll take a car over. Uh, and you can download DD. You can't put automatic payments uh, into it without um, an Alipay account or whatever, but you, I think you can set it for a cash setting. But I'll, I'll be honest with you, most of the time we don't really care if the other factories know we're talking to them. So we'll literally have, you know, we'll be done with factory one and we'll have factory two come and pick us up or if they can't, factory one will drop us off at the other factory. They're very, very uh, polite and cordial and they're all about, you know, promoting trade and cooperation. So I've never had a problem. It's only if there's like we're, we're in a tenuous spot with a particular factory and we may need to fire them at some point. We may not want to tell them that we're developing these relationships on the other side of town or whatever. But most times we'll ask them, well, here's where we need to go next. And they will volunteer to you know, put us in the best car they can find, which is usually a very nice car, yep. and, uh, and take us wherever we want to go. Yeah, it's not uncommon to be picked up in a BMW or Mercedes uh, at all. And usually, depending on how many people you have with you, it'd be like a Mercedes sort of mini SUV type thing. Um, and that's a great point. So one of the things you can do prior to getting there, you should try to arrange a lot of these things ahead of time, like Steve was saying. The prep work that goes into it really makes that trip a lot smoother. So when you're talking to the factories, let's say day one you have three factories you need to visit, ask all three of them, if they can provide a car for the day, you're willing to pay for it. Always offer to pay for something and then decide, you know, they'll let you know whether they'll take care of it or not and feel free to pay for it, right? And we, what we would do is usually have a car pick us up in the morning at our hotel, take us to all three factories and back to the hotel. And then, you know, a lot of times the factories will cover it, if, you know, depending on the factories we're visiting or we just did it out of our own pocket. You know, it was fine. We knew ahead of time. In fact, a lot of times whatever factory set it up, we just, we just tell them, hey, add it into the next bill, right, as extra shipping or something. Then that way when we wire you, we don't have, we can just do it all at once. I mean, it just made it easy that way. But you're right, uh, you know, the Uber, so to speak, is now over there. Uh, a few years back, that wasn't, and uh, now it is. So this is good information. Uh, and then obviously, if you have companies you work with over there that you trust, let's say it's uh, somebody who probably, like we had consolidators that helped us and, uh, they were really good people and we got to know them. So anytime we were over there, since they were a consolidator, they actually would offer up their time, their vehicle and go with us to the factory. And we're like, we don't care if they went with us, right? They're going to consolidate all the stuff. They already know who we're getting it from. So that's another great source to look at uh, to, you know, possibly see, hey, could you arrange a car for me? Or, you know, if you're having a little trouble. So, so talk about, let's talk a little bit about uh, once. Okay. So let's say you get done in like the Shenzhen area uh, I don't know how far north you've been, but let's say you end up flying. Uh, flying is, again, another one of those things you're going to want to probably schedule ahead of time. It's not that you can't uh, do it on the spot, but uh, that's another one. What things do you maybe bring when you're traveling? Like, I personally always brought, like, power bars. I had water. You know, is there any little things like that? I mean, obviously, a phone with a, a Chinese SIM card, an iPad, things like that. What little maybe things that they, we could help out with people before they get ready for this trip? So uh, now today, ch getting a Chinese SIM card is not easy. Uh, you have to show ID, uh, and often it ha if it's not Chinese ID, they don't want to give up any SIM card. So that that's changed a little bit. But you know, so my my, I suppose my philosophy is a little different than most. Like I'm, I travel a world all the time, and I've sourced from dozens and dozens of countries. So. It's not about comfort for me, except I like to stay in a nice hotel. You know, that's kind of my safe zone, right? So during the day, I don't really care. Um, they'll bring us water and, you know, we'll eat along the way and we'll be fine. If you have something that you like, I like raw almonds or something I'll bring. 
that's something that I, I it's like you can use at any time. It keeps well. That's that's a nice little snack. But I, I never really worry too much about that stuff. I travel super light. Everything, I, no matter how long I'm going, it always fits in a carry-on size bag. Um, doesn't matter how long I'm going. I, sometimes you can you can get your laundry done at a at a low rate in China. So, uh, but I, I travel super light. I'm always very diligent and very thoughtful about every single thing that goes into the bags because I don't want any extra weight. I I've hustled those bags you know, hundreds of miles. I wish I had a little counter in my, the bottom of my thing to figure out how long I've gone. So I keep it very light and very purpose driven and anything I need and need, you can put that in quotes, I'll get at the hotel or the factory will sort it out for me. But I definitely, um, kind of waive any of my normal creature comforts that I might get at home. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you hit it on the nose. That's exactly what we did also. Uh, the one thing I'm going to mention is, be prepared for heat during the summer and humidity and, and different kinds of humidity than we're used to even in uh, the East Coast. It can get really, really crazy humid. And then during the winter, usually there's still heat and humidity, but then it's going to rain too on top of that. So really check that weather at the time of year. And I do want to back up, and I think we forgot to mention, Steve, hmm. is Canton Fair happens twice a year. So just so you know, it's the same three phases happen uh, if in April, if I'm not mistaken, and then October. Right. And so don't feel like most, most of the time, the vendors that are at the first one, they'll be at the second one. Most of the time, not quite all of them, but a good, good majority of them will be at both. So if you feel like, oh, I need to go to the January phase one, and I'm going to go to October phase, or I'm sorry, April phase one, and then October phase one, you're probably going to see the same items. So, and, and the same vendors, which that's okay if you need to go back and see them. So, and it also depends on what are you ramping up for. If you're ramping up for Christmas, you better be going to the April one because you're going to need on. And so let's talk about on average, Steve, when you place an order with the factory, let's kind of go through the process, like the time it takes, what it takes to get over, you know, you got to wire it. How much money should I be wiring? Things like that. Let's just step in through some basics of it. We don't need to go too detailed. Sure, sure. So the, the first thing is, um, it, it, when you're bringing on a new factory, there's a slightly different process, right? It, it always takes longer. It always costs more. That's part of my uh, uh, philosophy. So let's just assume that you've placed orders with the factory before. A typical process is you'll figure out the lead time. Let's say it's 60 days. Um, if you don't already have terms with your factory, you'll issue a purchase order. They'll return a PI, a pro forma invoice. You got to make sure those things match. I, I really, really recommend people make those super specific. Every specification that you know, uh, every lab test that the item should pass should be articulated on that purchase order because it's like a contract in, in a way of speaking. And there are ways of making those enforceable, by the way. Much to people's, um, you know, the, the urban legend is nothing sticks in China. Well, you, you can actually get uh, things to stick and, and be useful there. So purchase order to PI. If you don't have payment terms, you probably have to wire some kind of deposit. Typically, 30% is how people line that up. Um, you know, but as you develop relationships and credit, like we don't, unless it's a brand new factory or it's a small order less than 20,000 bucks or something, we don't put any money down. And uh, then once your product is in production, you can decide what inspections you want to have done. Um, in some cases, some products will actually inspect the raw materials when they arrive before production. In some cases, we'll stand by for actual production and look at it on the line. And most cases, and I think this applies to most Amazon sellers and certainly most uh, importers, they should at least do a pre-shipment inspection before the product leaves. So they've got 30% down, but before it leaves and they pay the 70% once they get the documents, they should know if that product meets their requirements on some level. And from there, once it's released and everybody's happy, um, you pay the balance and then the product ships. That's the most common way things happen in my experience. Yeah. So anybody listening, if you, th this podcast is coming on uh, just after one I just did with Clint Hadeen and Clint went super deep into the process of getting stuff from the factory to FBA. So if anybody's listening and you missed that, go listen to the previous podcast. He, I, we literally, I think almost talked 45 minutes on just the entire detailed process, like line by line. I mean, it was pretty, pretty intense, actually. Yeah, and Clint's oh. brilliant. You should absolutely listen to Clint. He's amazing. 
Yeah, he's absolutely amazing. We both know him and he's, he's great. So let, let's go on to, okay, uh, we're going to cover two things that a lot of people have on their minds. We're going to go over the uh, tariffs that are going on right now, which uh, is pretty crazy. And then uh, I'd like to talk to you about, uh, Steve just got back also from Vietnam and looking at possibly sourcing from there, which I'm actually dying to hear about because that was one of the places I actually started to look uh, prior to selling my business. So let's uh, pick one of those two, Steve, and then go for it. Let's hear what you've got on uh, what the latest is on some uh, about those. Yeah, so one leads into the other. So let's talk about tariffs for a minute. So last year around this time, um, uh, the U.S. government started to saber rattle and go, hey, uh, we don't like what's happening with uh, the trade imbalance with China. Uh, we don't think it's fair, so we need to work something out. And a lot of lip service, a lot of lip service, nothing happened. So um, around September-ish of last year, maybe late September of last year, uh, <laughs> Trump issued a tweet, which is how we now communicate with the world. And uh, so kudos on the Twitter stock if you own it. I don't know if it's helping or hurting, but uh, a tweet went out and said, hey, by the way, effective Friday of this week, um, every item in this particular classification gets 10% added to it. And on January 1st, it's going to 25%. And we were like panic stricken uh, because we had literally dozens and dozens of containers on the water and, and, you know, maybe as many as 180 or so in production at some point. Yeah. And the way tariffs are applied is the import of record pays them at the point they clear customs. And so everything that was on the water, you can clear customs even before it arrives in port if you kind of know what you're doing and you have your paperwork in order. So we try to clear as much as we can during that week to avoid paying an extra 10%. Yeah. Then we placed a ton of orders to try to beat the 25% January 1 deadline, which ended up getting pushed. Yeah. And so we had a ton of inventory. I mean, we're talking about, you know, an extra 100 containers maybe. Uh, and we had to get extra warehousing for that because we were trying to beat that thing. And then things simmered down. It looked like the, the escalation and then all the talk was simmering down. But sure enough, in May, it just randomly just said, oh, by the way, um, as of June 1, all of these previously announced 10% items that were set to go to 25 in January, June 1st, that's happening. It's going to 25%. Along the way, China has issued kind of their tit for tat, you know, tariff increases and things. But it's really escalated over the last 60 days and in the last 10 days in particular, where now everything from China at least has a 10% tariff on it. Everything. Yeah. So. Yeah. I, there's $300 billion worth of imports into America that until about a week ago as we record this, um, kind of uh, early August, were off the radar. And I think the deadline is September 1 or something. I, don't quote me on that. But the last $300 billion are now going to get whacked. And during this entire time, we had been uh, diversifying some of our risks. So we look at Cambodia, Malaysia, um, Vietnam. And, of course, we actually even look in Europe and America as well for certain products yeah. because if, if it's highly automated, we can switch to industrialized nations. So, <clears throat> excuse me, all of this comes to say tariffs are unpredictable. They're out of our control. Our option is only to react. And when you get that, and I've recorded some podcasts about this. Um, people go to awesomers.com and listen to some of, the, some of the detailed ways that we try to fight or uh, mitigate the tariff impact. Ways you deal with your suppliers, you know, negotiation, currency, et cetera, et cetera. Way too deep to get into here. But one of those ways is, <coughs> excuse me, to buy somewhere other than China. Yeah. Yeah. So Steve, Steve had some great points he brought up there. He's unfortunately coughing. But uh, one thing I do want to mention uh, before Steve comes back on is just so people understand. So when we hit that first initial 10% 10, 10 tariffs, if you were already paying, let's say, 5 or 7% of tariffs, that got tacked on top. It didn't replace it. It didn't go, okay, I was paying 5%. Now it goes to 10%. No, it went to 15. It was the 10 plus the 5. And same when the 25 got added on, it got added on top. It didn't replace the current tariff that was there. It got added on. So I want to clear that up so people understand. Like, I mean, some of the products uh, we're, we're bringing in were, I mean, it's almost at 50% now. I mean, it's like 45 to 50% when you add those extras, depending on the product, you know, depending on the product. 
So yeah. that's that's so, what Steve's referring yeah. to. Yeah, sorry for uh, coughing up oh, a little bit. It's okay. Here, but that's what that's the chair of Skip Nail whipped up into a leather. So oh, yeah. yeah. Um, I'll give you guys a, just a quick example. So Rob's absolutely right. Duties are applied no matter what. That those didn't change. The duties are the duties, and they change by the harmonized tariff code or HS code, as some people refer to it. Um, just last week, just after the announcement of the ten percent. One of our prior categories that has a 25% tariff added on it already had an 8% duty on it. As part of this trade war, um, this happens to be hardwood flooring, this multi-ply engineered hardwood flooring, it got hit with an anti-dumping duty of 85% plus a countervailing duty of another 3%. Now, how they come up with all these slices, I don't know, but that ended hardwood flooring out of China for that particular style. Now. Yeah. Luckily, we already could read the tea leaves. We already saw what was coming. And so, you know, it had no anti-dumping duty on it before, and then it went to 85% just like that. There is a segment that's only 42% for the, uh, a certain number of factories. But the point is, this is a visceral battle, and you should really understand different routes to market, different supply chains, and see if they're competitive. Uh, Vietnam has a lot of opportunities. But it's got a lot of challenges. It reminded me of China 18 years ago when I first started going. It really uh, was, is you know, quite a ways back in terms of development. It's also a tiny country compared to China. So we can't just all say, let's go from China to Vietnam. There's only 100 million people in Vietnam. You yeah. can't replace China with one country. And so if everybody just goes, oh, I'll just switch all my stuff to Vietnam, well, you're going to find a rude awakening because they don't do all industries. They do some industries very well. For example, shoes, backpacks, uh, textiles, um, uh, foods, and things like that. They, they have a very, uh, very sturdy industrial uh, base for that. But, you know, if you're trying to get consumer electronics, it's not developed yet there in Vietnam. So opportunity, yes, but risks because supply chain and logistics are not nearly as developed there just yet. Yeah, that that's great. And that's what I was waiting to hear from you because I know you just got back. So... A uh, couple, couple of quick little points here. Uh, first of all, Steve and I are talking, it's the beginning of August 2019. So depending on when you're listening to this, things could have even changed again for all we know. Um, but so, you know, just to give people a perspective of uh, when we're talking and what's going on currently. Um, now, correct me if I'm wrong, Steve, but I, I know you, I think you mentioned that sometimes the factories will help a little bit with these tariffs. Um, maybe could you go into that a little bit uh, I'd, I'd love to hear what you uh, learned about that. Yeah, so here's the reality of tariffs, right? Um, somebody's going to have to pay for this stuff, right? So the importer ultimately is where the money's collected. But if, if you're that importer, you can't just have your margin disappear, right? You can't go from 0 to 10 or 10 to 25 and just have that money, you know, kind of show up. People are reluctant to raise their prices, although that's – definitely going to happen at some point or another. I agree. Um, and, and so the, there's different ways of trying to mitigate that. One of them is just simply asking your supplier, how much of this burden can you take on supplier? The other, um, uh, one of the things China did last week in response to the, the 300 billion getting the 10% is they devalued their currency and by about another 3%. So in the last year, their currency is down 10%. So the net effect, you know, if you're paying in U.S. dollars and you don't reconcile that U.S. dollar to RMB exchange rate, you know, RMB or Chinese yuan, you're leaving money on the table because the supplier gets the dollars and it's worth more money to them locally when that exchange rate changes. So that's one measure of trying to um, reduce the impact. But we had suppliers when the it went from 10 to 25 in May reach out proactively. Now. You have to do some reasonable volume, I think, to have this kind of proactivity. But they reached out. And they're like, hey, we'll take some or all of this under this terms. Please don't abandon ship. Yeah. And, and we know that they're getting some government support back on their side. You know, the, just like the U.S. government is collecting these tariffs, and then they distribute some of it to the farmers that are negatively impacted, uh, China does the same thing. Some of the tariffs they collect on their side – I think they're distributing out to states and, and certain uh, industries to offset some of the impact. So you want to ask the supplier, you know, how much they, they can go to bat with you and how much they can help you. And again, more volume you have, the more likely you are to get cooperation. I would ask them for other concessions like terms and, 
and and I would still be researching other alternatives because you may find somebody in Vietnam or Cambodia or uh, India that has the same product that you want and they may even have the same quality you want but their cost could be 50 percent higher than China is right now yeah and until you know that you don't know it and, and that's I really want people to understand there's a market price. There's something that drives the price of an item, and it changes by country, the location and proximity of raw materials, and many other factors. But China is super efficient, and we can't take that away from what they've built. is a super efficient world factory, essentially. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, one of the things I was thinking about when you were saying that was, uh, you know, at, it, until you ask for these things, you never know. Right. If you just keep going business as usual and keep ordering and these tariffs keep going up, the factory's happy to just keep going along with it and you keep paying that bill. So two things I want to point out is uh, most of the time uh, getting those probably better discounts is usually you've already established business with them and done some orders with them. Usually you'll get better uh, because they kind of know you and they know that you've got a business going with them. Uh, right off the back, maybe, maybe not if you go in there new and try to establish a company or a product with them, it's 50, 50 on there, but you got to ask. I mean, I would always ask. The other thing when Steve was talking about, just so people understand when he was talking about paying in RMB being the local currency over there, uh, actually feedback Wiz is a partner with a company called OFX and OFX is somebody that can basically help you set up that basically conversion of the U S dollar to the RMB to pay them in their own currency. And let's touch a little on that, Steve, that why is it <laughs> in the past I've had to either pay three different bank accounts that, uh, to the factory and I'm like, how do they own three bank accounts? I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with that. Why don't we explain why uh, they do stuff like that over there? Well, <laughs> you know, some of their reasons are, are their own reasons, that's for sure. But definitely, um, I, I will just say this in, in general. And I think this has is, is been very true and proven out over the last 15 plus years uh, that I've been trading there. I guess it's 2001, maybe 18 years I've been trading there. At some point, sometimes the factory will go, hey, we want 50% of the money to go to this bank account and 50% to this Hong Kong bank. And, you know, uh, maybe that's all the money there is. But, you know, if there's another little portion, they'll peel some off, sometimes even to America or other places. And many of these factory owners are doing their level best to try to – get as much money as I can and get out of Dodge. I, I'll just tell you, that's a plain fact. And I've recommended the book Poorly Made in China a million times. I will continue to recommend it. If people want to understand how adversarial it can be to work with Chinese factories, doesn't mean I don't like them, doesn't mean they're not my friends, but it means it's business first and it's, it's adversarial. Once business is done, then we can go be friends. But you have to really come to fight because they're, they're playing to win, and you should too. You know, you know, buyers from wherever you are, you should play to win because they're playing to win. Uh, Paul Midler, the author of that book, writes another book. He just released it, I believe, last year called What's Wrong with China, where he talks about some of the meta issues that are involved in China. And this is not a judgment about what's good or what's bad, even though the titles are a little uh, uh, leading. It's just about reality and about documented you know, kind of situations that you'll have. So you know, my impression is that at times they have different financial needs and sometimes they tell you to put all the money into Hong Kong because they don't know when they need to, you know, grab their go bag and get out of Dodge. But, uh, and other times there, I can tell you right now, there's a ton of factories in China relocating resources or building new factories in Miramar, uh, Cambodia, Malaysia, Vietnam, just driving across the border with equipment and, and skilled managers. And so they're now asking us to send money over there, even though the, Orders may be shipping from China. They're like, well, we need, to, we need to capitalize that new company in Cambodia. To us, we don't really care. As long as the invoice and the amounts are the same, what do we care where the money goes? As long as they say it's paid, what do we care, right? It's, it's really not our problem. But that actually is helping capitalize them developing uh, factory infrastructure in other countries as well. Yeah. Some of what I heard was uh, that basically the government in China – kind of restricts how much uh, money they get paid in US dollars. So they'll open up multiple bank accounts because each bank account can accept so much money. So I guess it just depends on what their, uh, what their goal is. But so anybody listening, if, uh, if you're kind of still like, oh, I want to go over there, but I'm still a little scared. 
Steve's got this very interesting uh, trip coming up, and we're gonna I'm gonna have Steve basically tell us what's going on. He's gonna basically escort you, so to speak, to China to see factories. I think also Canton Fair is involved. Steve, why don't you tell him what you got coming up here in October? Yeah, so I can tell you that I remember the first time I went to China in around that 2001 time frame, and I, you know, I went in like, hey, uh, you know, I'm John Wayne. I know how things work, and man, I couldn't read nothing. I remember getting lost with our translator, and she's driving us in the middle of nowhere. I'm like, just give me the map. I look at the map. There's not a character on that thing that I can recognize except lines that are probably roads, but I don't know. Uh, you know, the colors were, you know, uh, maybe that's land, maybe that's water, but I was out. I knew nothing. Yeah. And it was it was kind of uh, overwhelming and, and a little bit scary. And so um, I always imagined the first time I went, it would be nice to have more of a protective bubble around you. And so that's what we – we do from time to time. I've done this since about 2003. When I have time, we'll bring either big customers or other entrepreneurs with us, and they get to just tag along. And in this case, we're going to start out in Hong Kong. We're going to get to know each other, do a little Hong Kong tourist activities, little mini masterminds talking about how to prepare uh, for trade in China and so forth. How do we get terms? How do we negotiate quality issues? How do we make sure that they'll stand behind things? Those types of big issues. Uh, then we'll take the train up to Guangzhou. We'll do the Canton Fair for a few days, uh, three and a half or so days. Then we actually fly to Iwu, um, and we will do Iwu, the, the marketplace there, and show you the contrast between Iwu and Canton and how each can be leveraged to its own advantage. And then we'll take a bullet train from there to Shanghai. And, and that beautiful scene that, that you may see behind me, that's the Pudong area of Shanghai, very famous, uh, amazing world-class city. And we'll end there and kind of along the way we do these mini masterminds to let people ask questions. It's not just me. Uh, Leron Hirschkorn and uh, Isabella will be there and Melissa and Oksana and, you know, so many experts. And I bring my uh, a lot of my China team in various cities with us. So there's access to expertise that is really unparalleled. And we just kind of we throw everything into one price. It's like, well, here's how much it costs us. You know, just pay that amount. We'll take care of all the meals, all the hotels, all the transportation, and they don't have to worry about anything. And so, in essence, that protective bubble dream has come true. Yeah, and I think I think the only thing was they got to take care of their airfare or something, right? That was the only thing that wasn't included or something? Just getting to Hong Kong and yeah. flying out of Shanghai is kind of their responsibility. Yeah. And, of course, they also need a Chinese visa. Um, and some passports actually need a Hong Kong visa, but not nearly as many. But as long as they can get into the country and as long as they can arrive there. And by the way, I just ran, because uh, I may take my kids, a flight from Seattle to Hong Kong on Cathay and back from Shanghai on Delta was like $600 for, for coach. Wow. It's, it's really not that expensive. So that's the easy part of the deal, moving around, logistics, trains, um, and then all the show preparation and, and the ability to come and download with experts. Uh, I think it's unparalleled. And, you know, over the years, I bought three hundred plus million dollars worth of stuff from China. Uh, I've made every possible mistake at least once, often more than once, and uh, and I'm happy to you know share some of those lessons learned. Yeah, I I have to say, I mean, I'm a little disappointed. I I'm not going. I I've been a much times, but I'd love to go with Steve. I'm sure we could probably throw out a million things to watch out for and do. Um, Steve, how do they if they want to learn more about this trip that you got going on? Obviously, I'll post it in the notes of the podcast or the video uh, description, but go ahead and tell them uh, how they can find that online or what they need to search. Yeah, the easiest way is probably to just go to LeeRonAndSteve.com, L-I-R-A-N and Steve.com, yeah. uh, LeeRonAndSteve.com. I'm lucky to team up with, with folks like uh, LeeRon, Isabel, and Andy, and, and Melissa, and Oksana, because they're bringing language. They're going to tell you, you want to launch a product well on Amazon? We're going to tell you how. You want to uh, get it to uh, perform well on pay-per-click? We've got the resources and expertise to tell you how. It really is meant to be something that is um, so engaging and so relationship building that people walk away. And, you know, in, in every case we've ever had, people are like, that was the most incredible trip of my life. And many of them form lifetime uh, friendships out of it. So we're excited. We love it. And it's, uh, it's going to be an epic trip, I'll tell you that right now. Yeah, so if you're not familiar with those names he just mentioned, you need to do some research because those are amazing people. I've got to sit down with, I think, each one of them, if not almost each one of them, 
and uh, sort of pick their brain uh, being here at Feedback Wiz, but they are the, just the masterminds alone and having those people cornered, so to speak, and you get their attention and time is worth probably every dollar of this trip and besides all the rest that's going on. So be sure to go check that out with Steve. Um, and again, I'll have the posting, uh, I'll have the links in the description or in the podcast or heck, hit me or Steve up on uh, any of the social media platforms. I'd be happy to point you in his direction or get you any information you can or if there was a question. But if you really want to really dive deep into, uh, you know, sourcing from China, this is definitely a great trip to go on and you get Canton also. Steve, thanks for being on. I appreciate you being on the Ecom Wiz podcast. You have a good day. I love it. Thank you, guys. I appreciate everything. And everybody should go get feedback with right now. Thanks. Goodbye. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. And for more information, please visit feedbackwiz.com.